Back in the summer of 2016, two new games were announced to commemorate Sonic's 25th anniversary. One of them, of course, being the now-renowned Sonic Mania, and the other was a post-apocalyptic take on the modern Sonic formula. I will 100% confess that I was actually more excited about Sonic Forces and Sonic Mania for a couple of reasons. At first, despite the involvement of Christian Whitehead, this is not the first time that Sega tried to revive the classic formula. You fool me once. And second, this is the first game that Sonic Team made since Lost World in 2013. It's been quite a big gap, especially with all the Sonic Boom mediocrity in between. I try my best to stay away from gameplay trailers, if and if this particular one made me a little bit more curious. What's this? All the classic villains return? Metal Sonic? Shadow? Chaos? Uh, the red guy from Cow and Chicken? And apparently they are led by a mysterious new villain known as Infinite. Just looking at his design with his badass metal mask, I bet this game is gonna be amazing! No, it wasn't. It was pretty bad. <laughs> Man, I can't believe this game is actually a year old now. Listen, I know that criticizing Sonic games on the internet is like beating a dead horse, not to mention that this franchise is geared towards a younger audience in mind. But my issue with Sonic Forces is that the premise could have been amazing, but the potential was completely squandered. And to explain this, I need some help. I need someone with some honest opinions. Bigos? Hey folks, Honest Bigums here. I know, my name just rolls right off the tongue, you don't gotta tell me, but... Anyway, Sonic has been my favorite franchise for a very long time now, like over 27 years at this point, so... When Sega decides to screw up, I feel naturally inclined to call them out. But regardless, thank you for having me on board, Blade. Glad to have you here, buddy! Are you ready to criticize a story featuring a blue anthropomorphic hedgehog fighting a fat orange mustache doctor with a two-tailed fox? Well, that was awfully specific. Well, in my opinion, you are not a true fan of something if you're unable to criticize it. So, how can I say no? So, let us dive right in and see what plot Sonic forces upon us. Me. <laughs> If you haven't finished Sonic Forces and you intend to play it, I would love to give a disclaimer that this video is gonna feature a lot of spoilers. Not just for Sonic Forces, but also some other games in the franchise. The game begins with Eggman in his laboratory once again. The doctor proclaims that he finally created a weapon to destroy Sonic the Hedgehog. And right after we go to the first level, Lost Valley, or should I say Green Hill? I know it's unrelated to the plot, but what's the idea of having a subtitle to a Sonic stage? Not only makes it more difficult to associate a stage by its name, but it makes the whole experience forgettable as a result. The first level in Desert Green Hill is simple enough, I mean, for the whole minute that you're playing it, and then the first major event happens. Eggman is attacking the city as Tails and a bunch of the citizens cower in fear. Sonic is about to save the day until he's stopped by the aforementioned rivals. At the forefront of those classic foes lies the mysterious Infinite. Not only has he displayed speed that outclasses our hero, which, let's be real, isn't a real milestone anymore, but also shows an overwhelming amount of power to boot as well. I'll reflect on the classic baddies later, but the important part of this scene is to show how this new obstacle has far surpassed Sonic's skills. While Sonic gets tossed around by Infinite, it all seems to be over before it even starts. A couple kicks, and Sonic can't even muster power to move anymore. It all happens quickly without much breathing room. Infinite shows up, boom, bing, bada bam, and scene. The worst is what comes next, though. The game tells us, the audience, what happened to Sonic after he got knocked out. Time is money, let's not show the events, let's just talk about it after the fact. Things apparently got so bad that Eggman took over the world and only a few areas remained unscathed by his grasp. This would have been really dramatic if it weren't for one obvious problem. Why are we getting white text on black background? Right? Like seriously, how freaking lazy can you be? What is this? Times New Roman? Is this a video game or a PowerPoint slideshow made by a fifth grader? At least it didn't use Comic Sans like another popular Sonic game. 
Look, I never claim to be an animator or to know how much it probably costs to produce a scene in a Sonic game, but it seems rather bleak to have a life of a slide explain a key shift in the plot. Imagine if you played Sonic Adventure and you see the scene where Chaos grabs the last Chaos Emerald, and instead of this epic cutscene where Chaos sinks the entire station square, all you get is this. Chaos has found the last Chaos Emerald. He has now become perfect Chaos. Eggman has achieved his goal. Oh, poop. Oh yeah, that definitely struck an emotional chord with me. Honestly, I'll give the game a bit of credit here. Laziness aside, I felt the intro did a good enough job in setting the tone. This is a different take on a Sonic story after all, so instead of stopping Eggman's evil plans, you're undoing them. They were going for atmosphere in the intro, so I'll give them kudos. Although it is pretty annoying that Tails, or anyone else for that matter, doesn't even lift a finger to help Sonic out. Yeah, you actually bring some good points, and I do agree it is different to see Sonic knock down a few pegs from the get-go. But you can't defend the black screen text now, can you? Oh hell no, that was just lazy. And this is a visual medium, and if I wanted to read, I'd get a book. This is a prime example of show don't tell. Take Sonic Adventure 2, remember that scene? This is where Eggman tests out the Eclipse Cannon and blows up the friggin' moon! This scene, despite how terribly it's aged, is one of the highlights of the entire game. And no, I'm not talking about that creepy blonde girl. I'm talking about just the shock and awe of Eggman actually succeeding in destroying something. But you see how the entirety of the world is reacting to the disaster. This was the moment when I took the situation seriously. I knew what the stakes were. It's even more impactful at the end of the game when Eggman is actually defeated and everyone celebrates Sonic's victory. Now with forces, uh, this is not the case at all. After Sonic's demise, we learn that Knuckles has gathered up the rest of the Freedom Fighters with the help of Silver, because, you know, who cares about continuity at this point? And he even states that not only Sonic is gone for good, but Tails has gone crazy. Okay, this is a lot darker than I was expecting. Sonic's defeat is one thing, but it's actually affecting other characters in deep psychological ways? SP also lets the group know that Sonic has been gone for six months, which probably led to Tails going a little bit crazy. After Amy brings up the new Avatar character's data, Knuckles comes in to inform his team that they're about to lose Green Hill. It's funny how they treat the first level of Sonic history as a battleground now. Anyway, our Resistance leader brings up Sonic's defeat, which he immediately regrets afterwards. Eggman's forces have chewed through our defenses at Green Hill. Resistance in the city is reporting that whatever it is that finished Sonic... Sorry, I'm still not used to saying that. This might be a small nitpick, but I wish there was this moment of silence where Knuckles realized what he said and then apologizes. But it just happens too quickly and the scene doesn't really have a lot of room to breathe. And it's an ongoing issue with the entire pace of the story. Then we see the world map and the percentage gauge of Eggman's control compared to the Resistance. Does it mean anything? Not really. As you play the game, the scale shifts from Eggman's side to Sonic's forces. Ha! At least it gives a basic concept of progression, even if the UI for the world is rather drab and lifeless, even after you take control from the Rotund Doctor. Also, immediately after Stage 2, all tension disappears when Knuckles notifies everyone that Sonic is alive! Wow. That's just great. Way to throw suspense out of the frickin' window! So what happened in the six months that Sonic was alive? Well, apparently he was tortured in a prison cell! I repeat, Sonic the Hedgehog was tortured. Dear Lord, really? How is this game rated E10 and up again? But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Remember when Silver said that Tails lost it? Well, after the second level, we see Tails repairing Omega as Chaos is about to attack him. This begs to question that if Tails lost it, how is he performing an everyday activity like nothing ever really happened? I don't really blame the cutscene in this case, but more so the script. All that Silver had to say is that maybe Tails lost his confidence and that will be okay. It will perfectly explain why instead of fighting Chaos back, Tails instantly cowers in fear. It makes sense. Before Chaos finishes Tails off, he is then saved by classic Sonic. Or is it? In Sonic Generations, it was clearly established that Classic Sonic was Sonic's past self and enforces Tails retcons this information as Classic is from another dimension. So unless you believe in multiverse theory, this continuity is completely shot. 
Apparently at the end of Sonic Mania when Sonic defeats the Egg Reverie, he's being teleported to the modern Sonic universe. Now, I don't mind there is a tie-in to Sonic Mania, but I just wish that Tails didn't just declare right away he's from a different dimension. Might as well have Tails say, Long time no see instead. At least that would make me laugh. Hey, Infinite! Long time no see! I regret everything I just said. I do admit that the next scene isn't too bad. It shows a flashback of how the Avatar character was too afraid to attack Infinite as he revels in his cowardice. Kinda wish they would've showed how we survived the encounter altogether, but I'll give the game a pass this time. Also, I think it's kind of neat that the Death Egg is back, especially as a rather early level. In addition, we also get the best line in the whole game. None of this is good, Vector. That's why it's called war. I don't have anything to say. This is just pure gold. The next scene shows Zavik taunting Sonic as he quips once again. Now, I wasn't expecting Sonic to be actually tortured here, but I would have expected after that line to see Sonic at least beat up or somewhat emotionally drained from being captive for six whole months. I wouldn't mind it so much if we weren't given this detail that Sonic has been captured for that long, let alone being tortured. Now, it would make sense that Eggman would take time to conquer the world, so six months does make sense here. But at least if you stick with that, show us a more vulnerable Sonic. Being jovial is fine, but he looks and sounds the same way he did when he was captured. It's difficult to take a situation like this seriously when our hero hasn't undergone any changes. At least show SOME vulnerability. And while we are aware we're talking about a game that features a cartoon blue hedgehog, it just feels a lot more satisfying when you see a hero at his absolute low manages to rise to the occasion and save the day. And it's not that every single joke is bad, it just feels that the narrative doesn't go all the way with its serious tone. Having levity in a dark story is completely fine, but it shouldn't come in the place of both consistency and immersion. Sonic defeats Zavok and he disappears into thin air, and while Sonic decides not to comment on that, he does hear a distinct sound which is the noise coming from the Phantom Ruby. Sonic escapes the Death Egg and then there's just a string of levels without much development in the plot department. That is until Sonic meets Infinite for the second time and despite how he was utterly defeated, Sonic can't help but to quip. You were tortured for six months! What were they doing, tickling you with a feather? At one point in the story, Vector tells the Resistance that Shadow is attacking their troops. Sonic is sent to Sunset Heights to deal with the threat and is about to confront Shadow. Before Shadow lands a direct blow on Sonic, the real Shadow, Chaos Control kicks the imposter out of the way. And this is where we, the audience, officially learn about the truth of what happened to those classic villains. They're clones. Nothing like an age-old trope to spice things up. Can't have anything cool like maybe the Phantom Ruby awaken the evil in their souls. Nope, 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 no, 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 no. Clones. Let's go one by one. Zavok is probably the only redeemable character of the four classic villains, since he's the only one that, well, actually speaks. He's clearly a clone after disappearing like the others, yet he actually communicates like the original Zavok did. From the other classic villains, the only one we actually get to fight in a boss battle is Metal Sonic, and thankfully he actually puts up a fight. Million dollar question is though, where's the real Metal Sonic? We all know that he was built to destroy, you know, the actual Sonic the Hedgehog. Did there really need to be a clone of him? Chaos gets the worst deal of the four. He's only shown in that small scene in the beginning and is never mentioned again. My point is that those clones were there for just lazy fan service. That climax at the end with all the clones against the Resistance? Even could have had a giant army of robots and it wouldn't have impacted the story in any significant way. It's not like the Avengers would have been a better movie if we knew about the Chitari race and wonder what Grunt 14 ate for breakfast. They are literally there just to be father for our heroes to kick their asses. And it kind of works in Sonic Forces, just the only issue is when you make those characters in the shape of classic villains, you're raising expectations up, only to let them crash to the ground. Shadow's story arc was pretty much complete after Shadow the Hedgehog and, by a lesser degree, the accident that we don't talk about. It would have been a neat twist if Shadow wanted the power of the Phantom Ruby from Infinite for a selfish reason and realized his mistake later. Like wanting to have one more go at Sonic, like how Vegeta wanted to always face off against Goku in Dragon Ball Z. It could have given Shadow more character after he kind of became stiff and lifeless after the events of Sonic Heroes. It also raises the question, why did Infinite create those clones in particular? 
Did Eggman show him a picture or something? Also, why not have clones of the good guys as well? Having an army of evil Sonics wouldn't just be useful to increase your army, but it can also tarnish Sonic's good name. All of the populace who would potentially join the resistance would have reservations because they're supposed heroes doing a lot of bad things. Not to mention use other clones to infiltrate the resistance and get information about their tactics. Heck, Zevok proved that clones can actually communicate, so why not do that? It seems that for a character that's named Infinite, his options were rather... Finite. It's actually pronounced finite. I'm going to use my English as a second language card. <laughs> Welcome to America. We speak English here. That explains why my card expired years ago. You know what? Let's talk infinite. Sonic's villains that are not Eggman are considered hit or miss. For every perfect chaos, there is a black doom. Infinite had potential. For one, his design was unique. Not being a hedgehog is a huge change of pace. And I know that there are people out there who like Mephilus. Yes, those people actually exist. But no matter his accomplishment, I just couldn't take him seriously for two key reasons. One, he's a shadow clone. And two, his voice was an over-the-top cartoonishly evil version of the Pharaoh from Yu-Gi-Oh! On the other hand, I love Infinite's voice, and that's mainly thanks to Liam O'Brien, his voice actor. He makes him some imposing, threatening, but still being cool and badass. I can taste your terror, child. All that anxiety and doubt. It's delicious. But that being said, Infinite is kind of a wuss. Now, apparently, Infinite was originally known as the Ultimate Mercenary and was later hired by Eggman to protect his facilities with his mercenary group. Episode Shadow, the prequel chapter to Sonic Forces, details the strife between him and Infinite. After the second level, Infinite is notified by Eggman that his squad has been annihilated. When the two clash, Shadow downright curb stomps Infinite. And I guess the Ultimate Mercenary is no match for the Ultimate Life Form. Shadow belittles Infinite and proclaims that he never wants to see his face again. The mysterious villain in return shakes in fear as he yells an agonizing defeat. I'm not weak. I'm... I'm not... I'm not weak. I am not weak! No, but you're a pussy. This is the same bad guy that was able to bring the end of the world? The same one that helped Eggman take over everything? One would think that being the ultimate mercenary, you would think that he'd be able to put some kind of a fight. But not only that, the way he loses his cool so easily from just one battle with Shadow doesn't really convey the idea of a battle-hardened warrior, but a petulant child that got his toy truck taken away from him. Also, I love how Episode Shadow literally ends with the cutscene of Sonic being taken down by Infinite, word for word, like we haven't seen it before. I mean, at least Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 showed us the same cutscenes, but with different lines of dialogue and sometimes a different camera perspective. God. Also, I forgot to mention that we don't ever see Infinite's face in Episode Shadow. By the end of it, he puts the mask on, but it begs to question why does he do it in the first place? It's not like his face was sprayed by chemical acid and got mutated. I guess you can say that maybe he was ashamed that he let his squad down, but he never brings them up ever again from this point onwards. It makes the scene in which Infinite gives up his old self even more ridiculous, since the only thing that happened is that Shadow punched him twice, that's it! That's like if Perfect Chaos's motivation was to annihilate the person who flicked him on the nose. It just doesn't feel right. The worst part about Infinite is that his character never gets a resolution. The Avatar character gets over the fear that it consumed him in the flashback scene, and together with Sonic, Infinite is defeated. He just vanished. Poof. <coughs> Heck, I don't even like Mephilus, but he left a much bigger impact. He manipulated Silver, he led to the creation of Solaris, and most importantly, he killed Sonic the Hedgehog! Even if Infinite did help in Eggman's takeover, it doesn't take away from the fact that Infinite had multiple chances to finish off both Sonic and the Avatar character. And he just walks off because he thinks they're not threats to him, are you kidding me? God, I can't believe I'm praising something in 06 compared to Forces! Yeah, but let's be real, that was probably an accident. Yeah, you're probably right. 
You know what I just realized now? You see the Avatar and Sonic interacting, but you know who else is still around? Classic Sonic. There isn't really much to say about him. He's pretty much a bystander that doesn't affect the plot in any significant way. And even if we take the gameplay aside, which is, by the way, dead on arrival after Sonic Mania, he's nothing but a mere errand boy that is just doing the Resistance's dirty work. My whole point is that classic Sonic's inclusion is just pure gimmick, and he doesn't serve the plot in any significant way, especially because, well, he can't even talk. Uh, you worry too much. Look, I'm perfectly fine. It's been generations since I've seen you. Okay, fine, this line made me chuckle just a little bit. There isn't much to say about the second half of the game. The Resistant goes from one location to another in order to destroy all the bases that power up the Phantom Ruby. There is a point that Sonic and the Avatar get stuck in an inescapable no void until they escape instantly. So much for that detour. The end game occurs on Eggman's Empire, which is a setting for where Attack of the Clones happens. Eggman threatens to nuke everyone with a giant sun which was conjured by Infinite's ruby powers. This predicament forces our heroes ha! to pull back. The only way to negate it is by using another ruby which the Avatar found in an earlier level. Thanks to being a playable character, the Avatar can actually power up the ruby to its full potential. The sun vanishes and the prototype ruby shatters upon impact. All that's left is take care of the Phantom Ruby itself, as both Sonic and the Avatar go to its power source and destroy it. Hooray! The day is saved! Until Eggman reveals it was only a decoy. Apparently he fused the power of the real Ruby with his giant mech! Talk about a Deus Egg Machina! Get it? Cause he's an egg? Alright, but let's just end this. As Sonic and his friends defeat Eggman and Infinite, the clones disappear and the Resistance alongside their own army of Sonic OCs celebrate. At this point, classic Sonic just... disappears. No reason as to why, I guess Infinite just made him stay in their world despite his worthless inclusion, I, I don't know. I will admit that the fist bump and he entails share is kinda cute. The last scene shows us the Resistance together congratulating the rookie on a job well done. The only real issue with this is how we don't get to see the world rebuilt after Eggman's takeover. It would have been nice to see how everyone joins forces ha! and build a new world on top of the wreckage. Still, seeing the rookie give Sonic one last fist bump and Spider-Man away is pretty cool. As much as we ride on this plot, there are some things we genuinely appreciated. Most importantly, Knuckles. Since the beginning, Knuckles has always been a naive hothead that jumped into conclusions before thinking. The fact that he kept making dumb choices never elevated him much beyond his initial introduction. Sonic Forces actually gave Knuckles the respect he deserved all this time by being the leader of the Resistance. Those last few scenes of him leading the charge against Eggman? That's one of his best moments in the whole franchise. Better than anything that Sonic Boom has done with him. Also, the vocal performances are all great. No matter how dumb some of the script can be, the actors did a really great job with the material that they were given. And having your own character be a part of the story and help Sonic save the world is pretty cool. I mean, it's cheesy, but charming nonetheless. But by far the best part about Sonic Forces is that classic Sonic went back to Sonic Mania to save Mighty and Ray. Okay, so despite all the ranting and raving and yelling that I did throughout this video, I want to make it abundantly clear that I do not personally think that Sonic Forces is a complete disaster of a game. I actually really enjoyed what the story could have been. Like I said, instead of stopping Eggman's evil plans, you're undoing them. It had a good idea, it was just poorly executed. And I know, this video was about talking about the plot, but when it comes to the gameplay, I would have to say it's tolerable at best. Of the boost to win games, it's definitely the weakest in the series. Making this video does not come from a hateful place, as I don't want to be the guy that keeps saying, 3D Sonic games ruined the franchise because it's not who I am. I humbly believe that from a narrative perspective, Sonic Forces could have been amazing. They could have incorporated elements from the Sonic Set I Am cartoon to have its own dystopia-esque setting, and it could have been engaging. And honestly, it's not all bad. Some of the jokes, like I said, were generally funny, and I do believe that every single actor did a terrific job portraying their characters. 
But at the end of the day, no matter how positive I want to be about the narrative of this game, Sonic Force's premise is nothing but a wasted potential. Special thanks to Honest Biggins for the help with this video. I was recently featured in a Sonic Lost Soul review, and it was incredibly fun. So, why would you tell us what you do, Bud Bud? First off, I want to thank you all for watching this video and for making it to the end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And for those who aren't tired of hearing the sound of my awesome voice, I would like to encourage you to take a look at my channel. Currently, I do reviews of various video games. I just recently started up anime reviews as well. And I do intend to branch out and do other things in the near and dear future. So, I'll see you guys there. And Blade, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure, Bigums. And until the next time, thank you all for watching and take care.